I'm Jason Batchelor. I'm with the Intelligence Response Team at Emerson. And I'm Dan Eaters. I'm also with Enablement and Intelligent Response at Emerson. Cool. Uh, so our presentation is titled, You Mad Bro? And we just wanted to kind of talk about and go over um, kind of our journey uh, to Bro and how we've used it to kind of extend our capabilities on our team um, and really enfranchise ourselves as analysts to think beyond um, traditional, um, kind of the traditional SOC model of uh, processing uh, attacks and events, the security events. So the outline for this talk is really just, we're going to be talking about uh, kind of our maturity, kind of where we started and kind of where we're going, a little bit of philosophy too, um, something that I'm very passionate about. Um, we'll talk about our current implementation as well and some of the struggles that we had early on and kind of where we've uh, where we find ourselves, some of the challenges we had, and where we kind of solved them. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about kind of how we've extended Bro to kind of integrate with some of the custom SaaS that we have, and also um, a little bit of, uh, you know, the future. All right, so this is probably, you know, this is my favorite slide. Um, it's very simple, it's very to the point, but this really kind of encapsulates the struggle that we had early on. Um, you know, I came to Emerson from um, an area that did, you know, a great job as, uh, at applying intelligence um, to cyber threats. And one of the things that we wanted to champion is that same kind of mentality where we have our analysts are, that are driving our capabilities forward, right? Um, but what we had was kind of, um, you know, this kind of old school thinking of, well, you know, I'm a cert analyst and my inputs are whatever my security tool tells me to do. So if my COTS product flags on, you know, some backdoor, poison ivy, whatever, that's my input, now I need to do stuff, right? But what about the analysis? What about you know, as you process that attack and identify different things and maybe different patterns, how do you leverage that, right? It's more than just blocking an IP and bl or blocking a domain and um, re-imaging a box. There's so much more to it. Um, and as you start uh, doing more analysis and um, as a team increase your technical acumen and your analytical tradecraft, you start noticing things about adversaries. You start identifying campaigns. You start noticing different opportunities that you want to leverage, and you want to, you start asking yourself, "Well, gee, I'd love to be able to maybe detect on this, or I'd love to be able to um, to maybe mitigate on it, possibly." Um, but I can't because my COTS product, unfortunately, doesn't afford me that capability, um, or as I've so often heard, it's on the roadmap. So, <laughs> sorry. Um, that's kind of what leads me to this new school of thought, um, where you have, you know, you have COTS products, you have the best in class COTS products in your organization, and that helps, you know, definitely helps add value uh, to your team. But you also have kind of maybe something a little customized, something on the side, where um, that, that really just starts becoming a very preeminent force within your CERT and your organization. And as you're continuing to, uh, to do uh, better analysis and identify better patterns and trends um, and really kind of defining for yourself what actionable intelligence really is, you start inputting those things into your custom capabilities. And what you end up having is this amazing feedback loop um, where you are enfranchised to define what's actionable intelligence and you implement that in your capability and you have that feedback loop where your capability says, hey, you saw this again. And the team knows it, um, what that's about. Hopefully you've got it documented pretty well. And it's kind of a galvanizing moment. It's like, you know, hey, we just, you know, did something. We detected something that maybe none of our other COTS products did. We're really starting to take ownership here. And that's a pretty good feeling. So you have that great feedback loop going. So kind of the path to, to bro, if you will. Um, we had, you know, a lot of best-in-class ca COTS capabilities, but we had some of the familiar struggles that I cited earlier where, you know, a lot of them sometimes um, were kind of black box solutions, whereas we didn't necessarily know 
um, you know, what is this detection actually triggering on? Um, and sometimes we weren't able to be even told. So we were just kind of asking ourselves, you know, are we responding to a false positive? You know, what about this signature is high fidelity? Um, and that was a little bit of a point of frustration in some situations. They're also not necessarily as extendable as we'd like them to be. Um, so as we kind of went down towards, um, you know, continuing to um, kind of enhance our capabilities, we started asking ourselves too, you know, we, we wanted to seek validation. Like, am I really seeing, is the network traffic I'm seeing um, really everything I should be seeing? Um, and that's where we started to also notice, well, you know, our, not only am I seeing everything I ought to be seeing, but what other data points could I possibly be pivoting on uh, to kind of help um, circle back and uh, you know, identify other attacks? Um, and then the other common question is, well, I noticed something really interesting about this attack. Um, can I add or possibly add a custom signature? And unfortunately, the answer um, was, you know, no, no, not really. So then we started saying, OK, well, let's kind of take inventory of the things that we want to do, take inventory of some of the struggles that we have, and start kind of building something. And um, you know, let's, let's start sitting in the driver's seat here and start um, forging some, uh, some continuity. So that's where Bro really came in um, for us. So there, we started engaging our infrastructure team and kind of hash out you know, a tapping infrastructure that really made sense to us. Um, and that we could understand, and we got a lot out of that. And so this is, you know, the, the softer side of this, and not really the, such the technical side, is it really forced us to develop a common language that we could interact with with our infrastructure team. So when I say, hey, I would love to see external traffic in this area, they know what that means, because as a security guy, me saying, hey, I want to see external traffic, might mean to something totally different to an infrastructure dude. Um, who you know works on firewalls and actually plans that stuff out. So um, there were what well, there was a lot of learning on both sides too. Um, there was a lot of hey that's you know that's not supposed to work that way and you know we're the security analysts we're trying to um, respond to something and we're saying oh hey you know there there seems to be this gap here and you know oh you know what that that gap shouldn't be there let me fix that for you. So it was great to kind of get that uh, team continuity. Uh, not just within us, but within other organizations and kind of work with folks. Um, and uh, that's really the building relationships piece. Um, so it's really not, it's not always technical, some of the value add that you get out of adopting a capability like this. So Dan is going to talk about our current implementation. So that whole paradigm shift that Jason was talking about, I'm more of the um, driving the, or basically building the capabilities out I'm a part of that feedback loop with the analyst where they'll come back to me and I'll revise, reiterate, and I'm, that's kind of my role uh, with insert. But um, so we had a really cool pun for kind of what our custom implementation utilizing Bro was. Uh, we didn't include on the slide, but um, essentially it's a combination of a not only a sensor using Bro, but also a sc file scanning platform uh, made for and maintained by the incident response analyst at Emerson. So typical, you know, pretty standard stuff, 720, um, six, 32 cores, 16 cores per processor, RAID 10. Um, and this is basically, you know, our, our big daddy. This, these are the guys we deploy, say, in our data centers and our distribution centers. Um, you know, CentOS, Bro 2.4, one manager, two proxies, eight worker members. Uh, we use PF ring for load balancing and um, so that's kind of, we have, you know, like I said, these are our big guys um, for more tactical deployments or say per site deployments. It's kind of more of an ad hoc approach. Uh, we'll look at the hardware that's there um, and we'll also kind of scale down our bro configuration um, depending again on those, you know, different factors at the site, what kind of traffic we're seeing. Um, and so that's for the bro part really. And then I guess our second part, um, kind of uh, getting to the custom sauce that Jason was talking about. And I don't want to steal his thunder too much because he's super proud of it and it's a really cool tool. Uh, we basically have um, hardware very similar to this that sits kind of in a um, tapping cloud. And basically what it'll do is um, offload, basically look at files on the line and for certain meme types, we'll send off those files to our um, FSF scanners 
for the heavy lifting, it'll pull apart RARs and things like that and can do alerting using Yara. But anyway, Jason will get into that in a little bit. And um, we also use, you know, um, we're working on another implementation um, because now that a lot of services are being pushed to the quote unquote cloud, uh, we're looking at um, VM implementations. So, and we're kind of doing infrastructure management with all this using a combination of Vagrant and um, Puppet. So kind of a general router on a stick view. Uh, we've got four major hubs worldwide uh, with one major global G, uh, GDC data center. Um, and then you know we use, I heard the term Gigamon being thrown around, so that's kind of what we use, and those are managed by our infrastructure team. Um, and this is kind of the paradigm we have for our pro sensors. We have an internal sensor that monitors in, I, you know, internal IP space, external sensors that monitor external. And then um, for a lot of the smaller data centers that we can pretty much handle the, all the heavy lifting on one machine, we'll have a hybrid. Um, so that's kind of like our paradigm for our bro sensors. And then for the file scanning framework, those are separate dedicated hardware, uh, R620s, R720s. Um, and then, so this is kind of important because this, um, we had to you know, work like Jason was going into very closely with the infrastructure team. Um, and we pretty much had to, had to define templates um, for the different sites, you know, whether or not, you know, depending upon how many internal sensors we had, or if we wanted a hybrid sensor on a smaller site, um, and kind of iterating and reiterating on these templates we've defined, trying to figure out, okay, are we seeing all the traffic we're expecting? So, um, and another, actually, you know, Bro being a good security tool in its own right, um, again, like Jason was going on about, um, kind of, it was like our last line of defense as far as um, integrity and seeing, you know, verifying what we should be seeing is what we're seeing. So it really was kind of a feedback loop with the infrastructure team trying to figure those things out. Um, so anyway, um, in our, basically our, our um, global data center, you know, we're seeing a bulk of the traffic there. Uh, we had one ICS sensor, one ECS, monitoring internal, external on separate hardware, and an FSF. Uh, everything looked good, but at first, um, you know, we're seeing you know plenty of bandwidth overhead, um, you know, on a 10 gigabit line. Uh, but we're seeing you know 10 to 12 drop rate in Solar Winds, um, and we basically concluded that the number of concurrent connections was too excessive. Um, these were getting dropped before it even hit our load balancer, P, you know, PF ring. Um, and so our you know solution for that was kind of offset or offloaded to the infrastructure team. Uh, where they were able to do load balancing on the Gigamon and horizontally scale that uh, between an ICS-1 and an IS ICS-2 uh, paradigm. And really, that's at any site, you're seeing a lot of that. Most of the traffic you see is going to be that internal ISP, IP space traffic. Um, and the, so you can kind of see here what happened before and after this load balancing had taken place. We went down to about 0.01 drop rate, I think. Um, just a few more things here, just, you know, gotchas, you know, kind of look out, so you just need to, you know, maybe look out for, for an implementation using PFRing, uh, it's important that when you upgrade your kernel, you recompile PFRing, we saw huge packet drops when not doing that. Uh, and then P CPU pinning and worker nodes. Um, so like I said, on our, you know, the big daddies, we had, you know, two CPUs, 16 cores each, uh, we notice just better performance overall if um, by assigning all your worker nodes or pinning them to the f one CPU rather than distributing them across both of them. Neither of us are computer engineers, but I'm, I'm guessing it has to do with kind of the bus in between the two CPUs that kind of accounted for that um, bottleneck. So after um, implementing the two ICS sensors in the main hub, um, plus one ECS sensor and one F FSF scanner, um, this kind of kind of you know shows you what our uh, you know, peak rates are during a normal workday. Um, like I said, highest loads are seen as hubs ICS sensors. Um, and then all other hubs really, um, besides our GDC, we're able to handle all this traffic on one hybrid sensor, um, also with an FSF. So that, will, that was always gonna be, no matter what site, unless it's, well, no matter what data center, that you're always gonna have a dedicated file scanning framework. Um, and then again, for one ICS sensor, this kind of looks the same on both ICS sensors. Um, peaks at 2.2, utilization at 21% on average, and you can pretty much read the rest. So how are we taking all the stuff we've implemented and allowing um, our analysts to sit in the driver's seat 
how are we, you know, or how are we basically, you know, this whole theory, this whole kind of um, strategy of getting them down on the command line, not relying too heavily on COTS tools, um, especially with some of the inconsistencies that we see. You know, how do we um, enable them and extend what we have built so far that works for us so far out? And Jason is going to get into that. Thanks. So you can credit Dan for that amazing picture, by the way. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, one of the things that, one of the initial challenges that we had is once we started getting the great visibility that Bro started affording us was, well, okay, how do we make it queryable, right? Because, you know, ZGrep and Grep only really, it only goes so far, right? And you can't reasonably expect somebody, um, when you ask them the question, well, have we talked to this IP or domain? Um, to you know, hop on all these sensors that we have and start zgrepping away, right? It just takes too freaking long. Um, so that was our biggest challenge initially: is okay, well, how do we make this queryable? And so we started looking around, um, you know, at different things. And uh, what we ended up doing, and I know somebody asked um, earlier, like, what are people doing? And I know a lot of people are uh, doing stuff with uh, with log rotate and, and Elasticsearch. Um, that's definitely something that we're interested in exploring. What we have done uh, now, kind of in the meantime, that's worked for us and kind of aligns closely with the strategic direction of where we want to keep our team and our analysts focused is uh, just kind of compiling something uh, pretty simple, uh, just a, a Python, you know, basically a, two scripts run, uh, that were written in Python that just, one aggregates data from the con log and the DNS log, um, and it just shoves everything into a nice small little Mongo database, um, and uh, it just uh, we have then another script that affords a front end um, that really is the front end that analysts use to query that database and see um, for themselves whether or not we've uh, you know we've talked to an IP address or a domain, and that's really um, kind of what it, when it came down to it. That was the question um, that we had, that we were forced to ask ourselves a lot of times. It was saying, you know, okay, well, we just got, you know, um, an intelligence report, or oh, here's a uh, here's a, an event that we got from one of our COTS tools, and you know, we're we're beaconing out to this domain, um, or we're beaconing out to this IP address. What? Um, okay, so have we have we talked to it? If so, when and uh, where? Um, on what what uh, what sensor? And so being able to answer those questions really quickly um, is something that, uh, that was obviously really important to us. And uh, we also wanted to extend that too, though, because we also wanted to be able to pivot on those observables and dig a little bit deeper in the logs um, and search those log files directly. So um, you know, at the same time, we wanted to kind of keep our analysts on the Linux command line um, because that was kind of more in line with how we wanted our analysts to develop um, by, you know, giving them, uh, affording them the ability to use the tool that was written, that was analyst driven, and uh, empowering people to do that, but also saying, okay, well, um, you can use the output of that, and you can extend the utility of other common bash tools like, you know, Oc, Perl, et cetera, to uh, to a kind of further enrich your analysis, um, much in the way that you find some of the other. Um, some, some other great tools too, um, like, like Splunk for example, and how you can kind of extend your searchability uh, and doing some cool and unique things there. So this is really just kind of uh, the components of it. It's actually very simple. Um, it's just kind of a federated uh, database where we have on each sensor, we basically say uh, every time a log rolls off, uh, we have a cron job that says, okay, give me all the, uh, the con logs, give me your um, the DNS logs give me all the unique IP addresses, all the unique domains that we've talked to, and I want to know what sensor you are. I want to know um, just you know basic date, year, month, day, and um, and the the file that this is from. And once you have all that aggregated, show it into a database. Um, and so we have two Mongo collections uh, that represent both you know DNS and uh, connections. And uh, then we have a rotating TTL index. Um, so after a certain amount of time goes by, that data goes poof and it goes away. Um, and that's actually quite nice too because then I can look at an analyst and say, okay, I can guarantee that this data, this metadata of metadata, is going to be there for this amount of time. And that actually um, means a lot when you're doing um, you know, analysis on something because then you can authoritatively say, 
well, it wasn't here for this amount of time, um, you know, or I haven't see it, seen it in this expanded interval. And I know a lot of people sometimes, um, when they're doing things like this, uh, they use like cap collections, um, where you have storage as your um, main uh, delineator as to how long your data lives. Um, unfortunately, the disadvantage of that is, while sometimes it may uh, increase your um, capacity, you can't, it's hard to really measure or guarantee exactly how long that data is going to live in there for, um, at least, you know, uh, intuitively. So that's, you know, just, I guess, one advantage of the, the TTL index that we found. Um, all right, so like I said, we had a, a front-end Python script. Hopefully this is visible to you guys up there. Um, this is really just basic usage. Um, so basically we go through, and I just chose a couple of, uh, you know, two of my favorite hockey teams and, uh, and their uh, FQDNs, and I said, okay, you know, have we talked to these? Um, so the dash SD is to specify for subdomains, so, you know, video.avalanche.nhl.com is inclusive as well instead of just that domain. Um, and then the begin and the end, so starting and ending, uh, as well as what appliance did this um, spin off of. Um, and that is kind of nice, too, because it plays into this whole notional concept of, you know, okay, this is my external tapping appliance, and this is my internal tapping appliance, and maybe I only care about stuff here and not here, or maybe I care about everything. That's okay. Um, so once I do that, I can just very quickly get a result back saying, okay, well, um, yes, you've talked to these domains, and this is the appliance it was on, obviously, and this is the date, and these are the exact files. Um, so that very quickly answers that question, which is great, but then the next thing you obviously want to do as an analyst is say, okay, I want to dig into that data. And so then you want to, you know, you look at maybe the con logs, um, and so we, before I get too far ahead of myself, um, what we can do once we see that is we have an option, basically, dash P for pivot. And what that does is it just kicks off a uh, search on those sensors and says, okay, for those specific files, give me the data. Um, and after a short period of time, you get that data back because it's hitting those files directly. It knows where to go. And it also is nice and threaded and pulls that data down and sequentially sorts it, converts the date to uh, something a little bit more human readable, um, which is pretty nifty too. Um, so in this case, I looked, um, and even before I, you know, gave you this, I saw, oh, okay, well, yeah, there's, I see the con logs, and I see that's going over port 80. That's nice. I obviously am going to see, uh, see that in the HTTP logs, too. Um, so if I'm looking for some amplifying context here, um, maybe I want to do something like override that search, and that's an option that you're afforded with this script, too. You can just say, okay, um, well, I'm just, instead of doing a straight dash P, which search that, DNS log, or yeah, that DNS log directly in this case. Um, I'm going to do a dash L HTTP, which just simply overrides that DNS and transposes it with HTTP and hits that log directly instead. And then, of course, you have your nice results returned back to you, and um, you know, there you go. Um, so that's kind of a nifty little thing um, that we've kind of come up with, and it um, you know definitely solves that that issue for us. Um, it's not the most beautiful thing in the world, I'll grant you that, but uh, it definitely gets the job done. Any questions so far on any of this stuff? All right, cool. Okay, so what the next thing that we did um, that I'm really excited about is this notion of file scanning. So my, uh, what I normally do um, is, uh, is do a lot of reverse engineering of malware. And one of the things that always bothered me uh, when I was, you know, doing RE is, uh, you know, I'd come back to the analyst and say, oh, hey, you know, I got a YAR signature for you. I've got a C2 protocol decoder for you. I know how the config is encoded in the back door, so here's a Python script that does that. Um, and the analyst would say, you know, oh, great, cool. Um, but I would see the utility of those efforts. And, you know, for any of, any of you guys that have done reverse engineering, um, you know, that's kind of expensive coming up from a time perspective, at least for me, um, coming up with, with all of those deliverables. Um, and I would see the utility of that uh, vary in a lot of situations. It would vary with a, a lot of things like, you know, our exposure to that backdoor, whether or not the analyst is equipped with the knowledge to, oh, hey, when that YAR signature hits, I need to run that. So making sure that evangelism 
um, of that capability is done uh, to the team. Um, so, you know, I would see, you know, great wins and great efforts uh, in, in some cases, but in other cases, um, you know, especially if the malware is a bit of a moving target too, um, or maybe the adversary got smart and decided to encode things differently or compress them using something else, um, the utility starts, you know, would go down and that would make me kind of sad. Um, so I, you know, um, always kind of wanted something a little bit, um, a little bit greater um, to maybe take advantage of some of the observables that we have. Um, and, you know, I know what a, you know, for example, let's say, you know, if I write a YAR signature on a crypto locker or some common back door, um, well, if that back door itself is compressed using something like, you know, a zip or a RAR or whatever, um, that signature obviously won't hit because it's compressed, usually. Um, and you have to do some kind of decompression to be able to get that decompressed buffer and scan it and grant your signature a little bit more agility. Um, so what we've done um, is with what this file scanning framework is is say, okay, well, I know what a zip looks like. That's an observation. I know what to do with that observation programmatically, decompress it. Um, and I know that once I do that, if I feed that buffer back in, then I can grant my signature maybe a little bit more usefulness, possibly. Um, and oh, by the way, I know that some of the metadata that is uh, captured within a zip might also be useful to me too. And you could apply that same logic to executables and documents. Um, and then you start thinking, you know, I started thinking, wow, you know, like, I, this is a lot of great intelligence that may be actionable, possibly. Um, so, you know, you start kind of increasing the value of a lot of your RE efforts, and that made me happy. Um, and it really falls in line with something that um, Lockheed Martin developed uh, with the, the kind of the cyber kill chain approach. And full disclaimer here, I formerly worked at Lockheed Martin. They're, you know, very, very brilliant people um, over there. And uh, they were def an absolute inspiration for me in kind of uh, helping apply this mindset uh, at Emerson. Um, so what, um, what I'm really excited about and, uh, you know, what, what I love doing now is, you know, up being able to define what intelligence is actionable. Um, and it's, it really creates a lot of opportunities uh, for more advanced and creative uh, uh, threat detections. So what it looks like um, is something like this and kind of how we've integrated it with Bro is um, we have two modes, an interactive and a not interactive mode, uh, creatively named. Um, so we, our bro sensor, um, that is our kind of our passively, we have a script that just, okay, we're extracting files of MIME types that um, meet a certain criteria, and I'm going to shoot those file types to our FSF server, like Dan was talking about, and then I'm gonna pump them through this framework, and I'm going to, um, output the results to a file, and that's going to go to my database. And um, you know, whatever you know, if I have, um, if I've defined a YAR signature within my framework to be something that I want to alert on, uh, my sim will tell me if that hit, or maybe I want to um, alert on uh, something else and maybe get a little bit more creative with that output. Well, hopefully, maybe my database uh, and my front end sim affords me the capability to do that. Um, I kind of leave that option up to uh, whatever you guys got, you know, whatever folks have going on in the back end. Um, and then we also have our, the interactive mode too because I want this to be a tool that analysts use when they're processing malware and I want to be able to capture that intelligence too. So like right down here, we kind of have our known unknowns, right, to be all Rumsfeld, right? Um, we, and we've got our known knowns up at the top, we know what's malware, we're throwing that intelligence and um, pumping that into our database and we have our unknown knowns and we're throwing that intelligence that we derive using this framework and throwing that into our database too. Um, so that's really the kind of paradigm there, the interactive and the not interactive mode um, and why that's there, what it's for. Um, okay, so I like to live dangerously, so I'll do a demo um, and this is kind of um, what we have, the file that I'll be demoing this on. Um, what we have is, okay, we have a zip. Inside the zip, we have a PDF. 
inside the doc we have, uh, or sorry, inside the zip we also have a document. And then we also have a uh, binary with a self-extracting RAR, which also has just psftp.exe inside it. Um, so I look at this and I say, all of these things are opportunities. These are, this is, that zip is an opportunity to extract metadata and decompress that content, to iteratively scan all of its sub-objects. And that PDF is an opportunity to capture metadata, things like author field, creation date. Um, and that document is also an opportunity to capture metadata along those same lines. And that, that binary is also an opportunity to capture PE metadata. When was it compiled? How many sections does it have? Um, that, all that kind of stuff is interesting. Um, the fact that it has an embedded RAR in there is an opportunity as well. And um, the embedded executable in there is an opportunity to continue to collect that executable uh, metadata as well. And as I'm doing this, as I'm exploding all this, I'm scanning all those decompressed buffers with Yara um, and granting my signatures greater utility. So let's see what, hopefully this works. There's always that, you run that risk. So I have the uh, server and the client operating on the same machine. I have my zip, I'm gonna run this, perfect. So I have a bunch of modules that kind of operate on this buffer here. Uh, the zip, we have our you know, meta basic info module that runs on everything. Um, there's no YAR signature that is driving that module, it runs on whatever buffer is returned. Um, and I have scan.yara, uh, sorry, scan.yara that also similarly does the same thing. But I also have modules that are driven as a result of observations um, that I define. So if something's a zip, I'm going to label it as uh, something that I wanna maybe run my extract zip module on. And in so doing, I end up with three sub-objects that I kind of showed you guys earlier. So I have my PDF. Uh, my PDF, if you're kind of following the JSON output here, um, I say JSON, not Jason, <laughs> just because my name's Jason and that kind of would be weird. Um, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, um, you, so in, in the same vein, we have a PDF signature that hit, and that's gonna drive my meta PDF module, which will then dump out the metadata for that PDF. Um, and so then you have all this enrichment of intelligence. You have the same thing for documents too. Documents, as most of you probably know, modern ones are native zip files basically. So, you know, I have a YAR signature that detects that and then I'm gonna run and just process that buffer and I'm gonna explode that document. Um, and that I'm gonna continue to chew on uh, all the, meta uh, the metadata that comes out of this, metadata within the zip that I detect. So interesting things that may be, not, may be somewhat inconsequential, but I capture anyway, because I'm never gonna say no to data, but you know, what system was it uh, the, the zip created on? Um, th some of those things can sometimes be interesting. Was there a comment? Last modified can sometimes be said as well. Um, also, the, just the basic hash information um, of that buffer. And so I'm kinda gonna whiz by this because documents are, um, and can contain an incredible amount of sub-objects. Uh, one thing I will hone on, however, is uh, the fact that this core.xml file is in there. So that core.xml file contains uh, metadata properties as well that I wrote a ER signature for, and then I said, hey, when this ER signature fires, go in and run this meta OOXML module, which gives me some basic metadata of the document. And that gets captured and then sent somewhere, and that is something that maybe I want to detect on later. Um, and just kind of quickly rolling through here, uh, we have our self-extracting binary. Um, so I have an extract embedded module that tr uh, triggers on uh, buffers as well, and it'll go through and it basically uses hashwire to subfile to do the heavy lifting, and it identified the subfile, which is our RAR archive, and it says, ooh, I know what a RAR looks like because I have a R signature for that, and oh, by the way, I have logic that tells you to decompress it, so run my extract RAR module, get that subobject, oh, it's psftp.exe. Well, I'm gonna get the hashing information from that. Oh, that's an executable. Oh, it has PEICON uh, resources, um, which is just another signature I wrote because I'll tell you later why I'm interested in icons. Um, oh, let me run my meta PE module and give me all that data. Um, and then it kind of continues to go through and as you'll note, you'll have, you have this um, 
group for PSFTP, and then you have this group of executable hits for the, um, the overarching binary um, that had the, uh, the, the RAR file inside it. Um, and so I'm just kind of dumping all this data out and saying, well, here you go, analyst. Have a blast. This, is, this may or may not be actionable intelligence for you. And I can tell you, um, you know, kind of when you start shifting the mindset to start thinking about attacks a little differently, some of this is actionable intelligence. The author field of a PDF or a document is actionable intelligence. There are weaponizers out there that always use the same author field. That's a detection. That's an opportunity. Why aren't we detecting on that? The adversary loves to send executables that have little office icons to entice the user to click on them. Why aren't we extracting those icons? Why aren't we detecting on them? That's an opportunity. Why aren't we doing that? So that's kind of what this framework is charted to really afford people the ability to do, is to look at that and just give them the option or expose them to the data. The other cool thing about this is that all this data is actionable, but it's also historically preserved if you're capturing it. So if you have, for example, um, oh, and a, a perfect real world example is a bunch of uh, phishing emails that came in and hit us. And one of the things that the analysts um, noted is so much about this uh, phishing campaign changed, the subject, the, the uh, sender, all the indicators in the email header, and even in the malware itself, the macro was constantly changing. That It was basically just um, a Word document that had uh, enticed the user to um, you know, execute this macro, and it would pull down to stage two and infect the, infect the client. Um, but all these things were changing. Either, even some of the cool little metadata fields um, were also changing. But there was one attribute of this document that wasn't changing. Who can guess what it may have been? Any takers? File size. File size. So good guess. Um, it, so that changed a lot too because the macro was changing, unfortunately. But definitely a good guess. Um, so we we looked at the doc. I looked at the document and I looked at a bunch of different samples. And one thing I noticed just by opening the document, well the the image that they're showing the user to click to kind of illustrate, hey, this is how you enable macros in Word, that was always the same. That's an opportunity. It is. And we're already going through here and looking at, uh, we're decompressing that document as a zip. And I know what a PNG looks like. Let me write a YAR signature for that. Um, and let me write a YAR signature that looks at, um, at that, that PNG, and I can do it many different ways. I can look at the t first you know, n bytes of the, the PNG and alert on it that way, um, or I can leverage some of the really awesome uh, YAR contributions that Wesley Shields implemented um, from MITRE um, that, to just do some, some math uh, on that and compute the MD5 sum. And oh, by the way, that MD5 sum, since I'm capturing that, I can historically pivot on that to identify other instances that I may have um, that I may have ran into that I previously did not observe um, if I'm capturing all this data, right? So there's so many opportunities that really start to manifest themselves when you start thinking about attacks um, and data a little differently and what could or couldn't be uh, actionable intelligence. Really, actionable intelligence isn't something um, that ought to be imposed on the analyst. It's something that really be, ought to be uh, wrought out of good analytical tradecraft and effective processing of intelligence. And that ought to drive the capabilities forward, right? That's the new school, and that's the new paradigm. And that's why great capabilities like Bro, for example, really help complement that philosophy. And that's where we're really proud Bro users. OK, I'll get back to slides now. Any questions on FSF at all? Anything? That's kind of a lot. All right. So along those same lines, there are a number of really cool capabilities, too. Oh, let me. Two that kind of fall in the same fold and uh, try to accomplish the same thing. Um, what I want to evangelize here is this mindset. There are a lot of great capabilities by, written by very, very smart people uh, and very smart teams that do something similar. So Like a Boss is something that Lockheed Martin released that uh, is charted to do something very similar to what I presented. Uh, MITRE's multi-scanner is also something that's very similar. 
Um, and there's also something ca uh, called Viper, which doesn't, it's more kind of like malware centric and uh, you know, keeping that data historically logged. But I would say of these three, the top two are probably the most similar in terms of what they're charted to solve and how to you know, adopting this philosophy. Okay. All right, so what are some of the key takeaways here? So relying solely on COTS, um, while good, and I definitely don't want to bash against you know, security uh, companies and, and COTS products, they're fantastic, but relying solely on them isn't always the best idea. Um, you never want to rob your analysts of the opportunity to innovate past gaps that they see. Um, and you, know, you may end up, um, if you do rely solely on COTS, handcuffed to a capability that doesn't always meet your needs. Um, you need to, if you want to be world class, um, right, everyone throws around that term. I want to be a world class team. Well, then enable yourself to solve world class problems. So adopting Bro has been a key enabler for that. Um, and we've, uh, we've gained a lot of visibility in the network traffic. We've extended a lot to augment our own analysis and our overall te uh, team capabilities. And uh, I'll leave it to Dan for kind of the rest. Um, yeah, so our GitHub as of last night um, is now um, providing the FSF to be available. So um, go to our GitHub and you can look at the code, um, pull it, and let us know what you think. Um, so, and we've also written a lot of standalone tools for our own. We call it the uh, EMR suite. Um, a lot of different, you know, different command line tools for the analysts to use. Um, and also, um, you know, new Yara signatures, things like that. Whatever you think might be useful, uh, let us know. So, cool. thank you. Um, so with that, uh, are there any other questions? Plan on open sourcing any of the Mongo stuff as well? Uh, so yes, we would, uh, the, especially like kind of the query DB and how we've set that all up. Yep, that's definitely something that we're interested in doing. Um, and I guess if I may elaborate a little bit more on that too, one of the awesome side benefits of uh, having so much success with Bro is it's made our organization so much more amicable to the idea of open sourcing things ourselves. And that's been so awesome. It really has. It's fantastic. Um, Emerson didn't have a GitHub before we um, started using Bro. And after being able to demonstrate the benefit, um, it became such an easy thing to say, hey, uh, and work with our legal team and our leadership to say, we have something that may be bene may might benefit the community. How cool would it be to get our name out there um, and also uh, demonstrate and advertise to the world, hey, what are we doing? What are some of the problems that we're trying to solve here? Um, and it kind of helps enfranchise ourselves as well because we feel like we're doing a lot more uh, giving back. Um, so that's kind of a, not to derail completely from your question, but I think it's important to call out uh, that piece. Um, and just for what it's worth, um, Dan kind of alluded this earlier, but we do have our scanning framework uh, open sourced on our GitHub. Um, and we've got, I've done my best to document it as best as possible. Um, so what I lack in great coding, I hope to make up in documentation. We finished the readme last night. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> finished the readme last night. <laughs> um, so that hopefully is something that is interesting that people will check out. Uh, any, sorry, there was another question. Yes. Yes. So yeah, do you want to address that? Yeah, so we tag it, right? So you yeah. can see you know, uh, the region. Basically, we tag it by region, and we can tag it by the name of the sensor. Um, so there's a number of different ways. Um, and then it all gets aggregated in our log aggregator and Mongo and everything else. So. Yeah, and um, so basically, a lot of that goes right into the Gigamon. And then yeah. through that application, we're able to kind of sort out, OK, you, know, you get this you get a load balanced feed of this, and through that delineation of that internal external paradigm, we're able to kind of have a common language with our infrastructure team as well as on our team, a lot what, of talk, that, what that means. A lot of talks on like deduplication and yes. things like that. Yes, Making deduplication sure we're not is a seeing big double. thing. Yeah. Because <laughs> we definitely see that a lot, and we don't want to 
well, for obviously for performance reasons too, we don't want any of that data hitting us. So that was very tremendously helpful. Any, any other questions? Yes. What an awesome module idea. <laughs> no, seriously. So um, right now, no, but sounds like a great module, man. Um, let's write a ER signature and let's go. Um, any other questions? Yes, so yes, um, and how cool would it be if maybe, um, you know, going in the future, if we had, you know, we have high fidelity yard signatures on back doors and things that hit on things that we know are bad and we know we want to alert on, go over to Cuckoo, man, run that, get that information back and further enrich my analysis and data. I think, so I'm smiling because that definitely has crossed my mind and I think that's a great opportunity. Out of it because then from your perspective it's sort of oh thank you it's it's sort of end to end you don't have to think much about it you just say here's my cuckoo sandbox stuff and you know there is the report there still but bro also pulls stuff out and it actually puts it in context of your other bro logs because it can put the connection id and everything in there which nice. the cuckoo log's not going to have yeah. um the the problem that i ran into was the first file that I ran through Cuckoo Sandbox had a small JSON file that came out, and I did a really hacky sort of parse the JSON, and I actually had a Cuckoo log, a Cuckoo Sandbox log that came out, and I was like, great. And then, well, and I guess the, the other thing that was especially neat was I ran Bro, and suddenly a VM popped up. It, it was sort of a neat experience to see that. But um, going further, I, I ran it on another one, and suddenly I had 180 megs of JSON. <laughs> that, that came out of it, and I said, ah, I, uh, you know, it was, I, it just wouldn't work anymore. But um, I've done a little bit of work. Unfortunately, it's not working, not finished yet, and I haven't had time to work on it much lately. But um, I think eventually what you'll see in Bro is a streaming Yara analyzer, uh, <laughs> a streaming JSON analyzer. So what will actually happen is it could reasonably consume that 180 megs of JSON. And, um, and actually pull bits and pieces out of it, and it would be high performance and not kill memory, because that's the other thing. You have to be very careful about loading things into memory. But streaming the JSON through, it's never, it's never very much memory. Um, so that's sort of one of the challenges there, is that you, you can't anticipate the size of the report that's coming back. And you really need to read through the whole report, you, yeah. you, because your data you might be interested in might be at the very bottom. And, um, this is sort of on the radar a little bit. I mean, not to not on the radar to the point of putting it on the uh, the the upcoming work. But as Robin said, who knows? <laughs> um, but yeah, like if that kind of stuff happens, it opens the door for a lot of really neat integrations because then you can start loading in these really massive data sets or, or integrating with these external tools that maybe output JSON and reasonably get that data back into Bro in. Uh, and, and then you get the, the context that you sort of want, where you have the bro log that is like, oh, well, you know, we, we extracted these four or 10 fields out of the Cuckoo Sandbox report, and it has the connection unique ID, which is suddenly like, oh my gosh, it, it's the full, like, it's a bro log, but it's a cuckoo box. It's, it's a cuckoo box thing distilled into a bro report, which then you can actually have linked to the full Cuckoo Sandbox report on some other file system if you're interested but it can all be contained there and, and should be really easy to deploy. I mean, that's another yeah. thing that I think that we yeah. typically focus on is making sure that these systems not only work, but work efficiently, work at high, at high scale, and are easy to install, which, which is a really hard set of goals to aim for. But you know, I, I think we're slowly on a path to get there. Great. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? All right.
Well, thanks so much for your kind attention. I appreciate it.